let's talk about what the technology is under the hood, the kinds of data architectures and technologies that are powering these real-time proactive agent pipelines. So, Raghav, how do you ensure low latency decision making, traceability, and scalability? Again, to ensure like any kind of like low latency or thing, AI systems are designed to act autonomously and proactively. It requires a well-architected framework that balances autonomy with controls and performance. That would in, in turn ensure like low latency decision making as well as traceability and scalability while implementing and adopting to like agent AI. See, one of the ways like I've kind of like seen is implementing ML ops that would help so that the machine learning models are deployed, monitored, and maintained efficiently. That also helps to enable applications to deliver real-time responses, at not only at speed, while also remain scalable and reliable. And some of the approaches like I have used, so like uh, to, re is like for, uh, to reduce latency from agentic systems in decision making, includes like edge computing and local inference. So that is like, deploy models on the edge so that you can like see what are the round trips to reduce the round trip uh, time to cloud servers. That's some of the things like which is like can be quantified. So and also there are also image driven architectures where like agents should like respond to events in the real time in a particular way. Some tools I have used is like Kafka or like MQTT and also using like a reactive programming or to prioritize responses. And also and also the key important thing is like having some kind of a pre-compiled like, decision trees. So that's like policy caching and so that like people can like, reinforce any of these learnings and everything. And when it comes to like traceability, we need to ensure that like all agent actions can be audited. That's and, and understood. First thing is you need to understand what are these agents doing, why we are even using these agents and what's the main purpose of it. So we can take like steps like, like uh, action logging, and also like a develop like vision models and policies and also having create a governance layer for ethics. Those are all some of the things which you can kind of play, uh, use to. And finally, scalability is very critical when it comes to scaling any of your models from your sandbox to your production environment. You need to make sure to enhance scalability. You need to ensure that agentic AI systems can scale across many users, tasks, and environments. So we can... Some of the things like I've used and which we can apply is like microservices architecture to encapsulate the agents in independent services that can like scale horizontal. And also like use like orchestration tools like um, Kubernetes or Nomad to manage like um, agent instances as well. And also asynchronous task management also plays a good way. An agent should run asynchronously and be stateless when like a uh, possible, whenever it's possible. And then queuing by using like um, tools like a uh, RabbitMQ, Celery to distribute the workload efficiently helps with like scaling. And memory plays a big role like irrespective of what it is. Compute is money. Com compute is everything at this time. So using like distributed data stores or sharing across like cross agents also helps. And finally, uh, one more thing that I would like to add is like the uh, vector DBs for shared memory when agents like access a large context spaces. And also load balancing and rate limit, uh, limiting is also a key component. So dynamically scaling like inference and then also planning based on usage and monitoring the weight limit like uh, helps you to prevent overload. So these are some of the things like which I kind of like uh, see to ensure low latency, decision making, traceability, and also scale your agent AI to be more efficient and then improve performance. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Raghav. Noel, what's what's the stack behind your AI agents? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so here's the good news is that there, as many of you know, there are thousands of uh, different ways, architectures that you can use. I think it's important to kind of recognize that there is a difference between how you architect an agentic solution and how you, and then the infrastructure that supports it. During my work at Google, Amazon, and IBM, helping them build out their solutions, which I actually think uh, I, we had talked a little bit about before, like many times, which is why I use this baby tig tiger reference, many times when you start building a solution, you never know how big it's going to be. It's adorable and cute and usually does one thing, but over time it starts to grow. This is what happened at my time at Alexa. I was employee 10 on Alexa. And when we started, 
no one was using it. Now it's in 300 you know, million homes, right? So you, you don't know what you're getting yourself into when you build. So I actually have a, a slightly maybe controversial philosophy that I build everything as if it will be part of an agent, uh, agentic web, an agentic environment, an agentic solution. I want whatever system I build to be able to participate in an autonomous workflow. That being said, the stack of technology, granted, I'm a Microsoft MVP, which means I was given an award for the work that I do on Microsoft AI, but I grew up at Amazon. I love Google, right? So I'm a, a Jill of all clouds, as they say. Um, but my tech stack typically ends up being some level of an agentic framework and not a framework like an ideation framework. I mean, like framework. I grew up on semantic kernel. I was one of the earliest testers of Semantic Kernel, and this is where my stack begins. Semantic Kernel is actually technology agnostic, but it, it provides an orchestration layer. For some of you who are cloud, I think most of the panelists here come from kind of enterprise cloud backgrounds. Like back in the day, right, we went from building individual services to making those services and deploying them into some kind of containerized platform. We're doing the same thing with agents, right? We we need a control plane so that we're not writing security, authentic, you know, authentication, authorization, RBAC for every single agent. We're going to want to build a tech stack that allows us to actually do that as a whole. So I always encourage companies, the good news is you probably already are in a cloud. <laughs> so take advantage of the cloud, like AI and specifically agentic AI, it's as secure as you are. So like use the work you've already been building in your cloud solution and apply your agentic models to that. See, agentic AI, I would like to add like one point is like a, it's a new breed of intelligence designed not to just respond, right? But it also helps to decide, coordinate and make decisions and act. And you need a foundation. That's what like exactly as Noel is saying, without this foundation, you are not feeding intelligence. You are just feeding confusion. Thank you so much, both of you. Kohai, what role does human feedback loops or policy injection mechanisms play in real-time prediction and correction? My view is the agent is not the promises to predict accurately in the loop of the feedbacks. The human intubation is adjusting of the, any of the mistakes and setbacks from the AI identification processes. That might be the reason with some of the questions. As for the one example is the past case is in the UK, the tax driver identification system was not in the work in the property due to the failures of the facial recognition technology to authentication the specific Uber drivers to accesses of the Uber service. Uh, due to these failures, the Uber uh, driver was not able to get the salary from this System, so that's been arising of some of the questions. So we always just see the standout, the both of the uh, system and the human beings to be working in together to check the whether the data process to make an accurately. Otherwise, a victim is existing in the data of the uh, like the AI um, period. So that that's a becoming a concerns. So the Data protection is the one of the trial at this moment, the challenges for all the system to uh, find the best way to both the existing of the human and the uh, uh, automation all together. Thank you so much, Kohai. Dutch, what's changing with LLM streaming data and vector databases being woven together into these agent pipelines? Yeah, and so that's a great question. It kind of ties together the last couple of answers. So first of all, um, sort of in kind of everyday parlance, so people who don't necessarily have a, a you know a long history of working in AI day to day, we're sort of using LLMs as it's and it's kind of a conflation, right? A, a large language models are in of themselves a thing, but there's certainly small language models, right? There's other there's other approaches, as, as Noel mentioned, right? So so what you're seeing is there was this movement towards large language models, um, you know. 24 months ago, 28 months ago. And what you've seen in, in real world applications is sometimes it's actually more efficient and more, uh, there's a higher efficacy, meaning that the, the answers, the outcomes are, are a higher degree of confidence for you to actually use a small language model. So I just want to point that out, right? So we sort of use these terms um, as if they're all interchangeable, but, but they're really not. But one of the things that's really happened, and I'll do call back to, to what Sumit mentioned, is you know, the ability to use semantic search, right? So when you look at vector databases as an example. And again, 
as a user, uh, even as a CEO of a company, you may not need to know the details of this, but think of it this way. What a semantic search allows you to do is use natural language. So you could say a phrase like, um, my laundry room is flooded, my pipes are leaking, or I need a plumber, right? And a semantic search will understand that those things are actually an approximation for the same thing, meaning please call a plumber, right? So that's the difference, right? And kind of just simplistic terms, because I don't want to get overly technical about it, right? Or if you're looking for a book in a library and you didn't know the exact title or the exact section, right? You could say, um, teenager, magic, university, right? And you're going to get Harry Potter and, and related things, right? Semantic search is very, very powerful, right? Um, but you do have to... Um, you do have to secure that to a little bit to Noel's point, right? So there's some nuance there because using retrieval augmented generation to make that call, it is a bit of a different architecture. It's newer for some companies, right? So I would just say that that the good news is a lot of these concepts to Noel's point are, are not new, right? So again, I think of like ask, I have six kids, right? They're aged from teenagers to in their 20s. Yeah. So I always ask them. And so when I started talking about AI and doing talks, I'm like, hey, what do you think AI is? And frankly, uh, to you know, shout out to Noel, it was, it was Siri, it's Alexa, it's Hey Google, right? And I'm like, cool. Those are machine learning. Those are not AI, right? AI is a superset. Like that's like saying sports, right? And that's, and then basketball is a subset, right? Machine learning, that term has been around since 1959, right? We, we understand machine learning very, very well. Right, so the good news here, to Noel's point, is we have a lot of history with AI. It's sort of just sort of the zeitgeist has, has raised with, with the, the chat GPT sort of for the average person. But we have a lot of experience with it, right? But you need to think about there are some nuances to Raghav's point, right, of how they operate. And there's also a little bit of sort of anthropomorph, uh, the ability to think that, oh, it's, it feels like a human, right? So you have to think through those processes. But, but we have a lot of history still. So. Uh, those are some of the new things, uh, and, and Kafka, uh, as was mentioned as well, right? That ability to do real-time streaming is important. I couldn't agree more. Sumit, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Are we ready to trust AI agents with our decision-making? I would say we are somewhere towards the lower end of the spectrum, right? As I said, one of my challenges when I'm working with uh, with agents is, if I chain agents, like the same example I gave, gave earlier, right? And one of them has an accuracy of 0.7 or 0.75, which, which is still pretty high. And I chain multiple of them, the whole reliability goes down, right? You're multiplying 0.75 all the way, and then you're, it's as good as tossing a coin. So I guess we are, um, <clears throat> we are still not there. It's a long way, right? However, I think a few months back, Gartner came up with this, uh, with this whole idea about an AI agent triangle which they say is that, um, you know, agents are today, agents today, agents 1.0 are sort of um, struggling to simultaneously achieve high versat versatility, capabilities, as well as reliability. You can choose two of them, but you don't get all three at the same time, right? And um, the explainability aspects of AI models is also, you know, there is a disconnect, in my opinion, between market expectations and the general purpose AI agents, um, which should be able to take up more broader scope of tasks than what is possible today. That's where I think is the state of the art right now. 